everyone, Hezu here. Sorry for the delay in videos. I caught COVID and I'm working on like two other YouTube projects. And the last month has just been a little crazy, but hey. I saw Wendell and Wild on Netflix a long while ago and completely forgot to review it. So better late than never. To summarize, two demon brothers, Wendell and Wild, are in servitude to their father, King of the Underworld. They use a magical hair cream to regrow his hair through eternity. One day, the brothers eat the cream, making them hallucinate, where they are suddenly teleported to the human world and turn into a two-headed worm? that just so happens to appear from some random girl's candy apple? That random girl, Cat is her name, screams, which distracts her parents and gets them killed in a car crash. Several years later, Cat, after apparently being stuck in a juvenile prison, has been given a second chance at a religious all-girls school back in her hometown. She finds out her parents' famous brewery burned down, and with the main source of income gone, the rest of the town became deserted. She is welcomed by three of the top student preps. She saves the life of one through apparent future vision. Cat finds out the head priest took her in for money to save his school, but he insists she needs a fresh start herself. She meets Raoul, a trans boy artist who, despite constantly being treated like absolute garbage by Cat, sticks to her side. While in class, Cat is asked to approach an octopus for better observation, when suddenly it turns demonic, freaking everyone out. Cat gets zapped by something in the desk drawer of Sister Helly's class, injuring her hand. Sister Helly takes her aside and says Cat is very special and that she must tell no one about the new mark on her hand. Way to be mysterious, Sister Helly. We cut back to Wendell and Wilde, presumably a few years later, and they receive a weird pink egg bubble message informing them they have received a new hell maiden scouted out by something called bearzebub they decide they want to go to the human world to build their luxury theme park up there instead since their father refuses to accept their plans down there we cut to priest bests playing golf with the klaxons it's revealed they are trying to build a private prison in town but the council keeps blocking their efforts priest bests reveals he vouched for them the night of the brewery fire indicating they are arsonist murderers they then decide to kill priest bests to keep him from talking we cut to raul's mom revealed to be investigating the brewery fire and the resulting worker deaths she thinks it's the klaxons fault but she doesn't have any witnesses raul goes on to the roof to to start painting. Wendell and Wilde visit Cat in her dreams and tell her to summon them on the full moon using Bearzebub with a witness present. They promise to raise her parents from the dead if she does this. Cat steals the bear when the handicapped janitor comes in, mumbling to himself that Sister Helly is a thief, writing it on the chalkboard as Cat escapes. Wendell and Wilde discover their father's hair cream can revive the dead. Lucky break for them. Cut to the land of the living, where we are having Priest Best's funeral. After being rude to everyone there, Cat snags Raoul, dragging him along as her witness, refusing to explain anything to him. She brings the bear to her parents' grave and summons her demons. Wendell and Wild are summoned slightly off course, leaving both of them confused and Cat upset and betrayed. Sister Helly shows up and scolds them. They return to the school. Wendell and Wilde are confused where their hell maiden is, so they decide to make the most of it and test their cream on the recently killed priest. He awakens and they threaten him for money. The priest tells them, unfortunately, that these boys, they came to a ghost town with no money. When they threaten to unalive him again, he says the Claxons can fund their theme park as well as his own school, which makes them team up together, I guess. Sister Helly confronts Cat. And later, Siobhan visits Cat with cookies, worried, but also ignorant to what prison life is really like. Cat and Raoul fight over Cat's alleged demons. The undead priest announces over the intercom that he has returned. Everyone is shocked and excited. Cat becomes angry that he was revived and not her parents. Sister Helly leaves the classroom, disappearing into a cloud of smoke behind a secret doorway, revealing her supernatural power. Cat, for some reason, drags Raoul with her to confront the priest. He calls in the nuns to punish them for detaining him and then proceeds to call the Claxons again. Sister Helly speaks with the wheelchair guy. I think his name is Manberg. Something something wheelchair guy groomed her. Something something wheelchair guy likes supernatural stuff and knows Cat is a new hell maiden who stole something called bears above. What the? What is a bears above? What is this thing? That's a bear. Is it a bub? 
I'm confused. <laughs> Kat and Raoul are serving detention of sorts when Kat decides to escape. Raoul follows her, and Sister Helly calls out for them when she realizes they're gone. The priest meets up with the Claxons, who try to attack him again, but he introduces them to Wendell and Wilde, explaining their plan to raise the dead council members who will vote in favor of their private prison. In exchange, they will fund the school and the Demon Brothers Fair. The Claxons warn them that if they were to raise any others from the dead, the deal is off. Kat finds the Demon Brothers and yells at them. They go back on their words, saying they have a new deal. Kat has to serve them for eternity if she still wants them to bring back her parents. Ignoring Raoul warning her against it, she agrees, now sworn to do everything they ask of her, like getting them takeout food. The demons take Raoul hostage, making him dig graves, and Kat acts like an asshole to him. Again! Wendell and Wilde resurrect the council members and start eating the rest of the hair cream. Raoul scolds them, saying there won't be enough for Kat's parents. That's when Wendell and Wilde reveal they actually won't be resurrecting her parents, so Raoul escapes and steals the cream and resurrects Kat's parents on his own. Wendell and Wilde hunt him down, while their dad notices they've gone missing. Kat notices the resurrected council members and rushes to her old home to find her zombie parents. They try to catch up, but then they reveal Raoul is the one who resurrected them, not her demons. Her parents realize Raoul is in danger and get up to help them. Kat doesn't want them to. They scold her for not helping her friend, and she begrudgingly goes to help him while telling her parents to sit and stay at the house. Kat saves Raoul and stages the scene to look as though Sparkplug killed and ate them. Wendell and Wilde's father, Buffalo, finds out where they went and gets pissed. Helly confronts Kat, revealing that she too is a hell maiden. She returns Bearzebub to Manberg. Kat is suddenly sick? With a fever? Like some kind of demonic possession? Manberg brings out a vacuum, but then Helly tells him she needs a second hell maiden to stop the undead army now raised in town and requests to be bloodbound? This can apparently kill her, and they have this place called a redemption chamber they go in together? The dead council members vote to pass the Claxon prison proposal. Shaban confronts her parents, suddenly knowing the corruption behind the prisons they own, clearly upset. She promises to be at the opening ceremony, scheming against her parents. Kat confronts her past, taking form of a demon alike herself. She beats it up and then gets sucked into a wall. Awkward cut over to the priest telling Wendell and Wilde to deal with Kat's parents. Cut back to Kat and her monster, in the end hugging to accept it. Cut to Buffalo standing up, destroying his fare in the process to reach the surface. Then cut to Kat's parents just hanging out with Raoul, dancing, doing nothing else, and then they get kidnapped. Manberg helps Sister Helly after she got a concussion. He reveals he collects demons. Raoul warns Kat that her parents have been kidnapped. Siobhan tries to find Kat and warn her of a different emergency. Wendell and Wilde go to re-kill Kat's parents, but her parents make fun of them. Kat finds them and yells at them again. Raoul takes the priest away, disappointed in him. Kat asks them why they'd try to re-kill her parents, and the priest explains it was the only way to save the school and fund their theme park. Shaban finally shows up and Kat threatens her for some reason. Shaban explains she understands about prisons now and shows that the money the priest and the demon brothers got was fake money. Shaban takes them to the lookout peak and wants to show them something? And that's when Kat has a vision of the town being demolished? We never really know what Shaban was actually trying to show Kat because Shaban doesn't know exactly that Cat has future vision. Like, what What was she trying to show her? I don't really get it. Anyway, Wendell and Wilde's father break to the surface and snatches everyone. He argues with his sons. All of a sudden, the sun comes out and in a manner of seconds, melts all the snow off every roof in town, revealing Raoul's art project, a parent protecting their child. Buffalo Belzer is moved by this and explains to his sons that he had other children before them, but they never came home. 
Manberg reveals he kidnapped all his children and will return them to him if he lets everyone go. Buffalo accepts and tells his sons they will be designing his new underworld fair. The priest keels over it and dies again. Buffalo reveals that the hair cream's magic is only temporary. Kat is devastated by this, especially knowing there's so little hair cream left. Her parents tell her to use the cream instead to save the town by resurrecting witnesses in the brewery fire. In the meantime, the rest of the gang attends the Claxon press conference in protest, blocking off the demolishers, who also just so happen to be the resurrected council members for some reason. The Claxons want them all dead, including their own daughter who stands amongst the protestants. We have a fun action-oriented fight scene, and they manage to stop the town's demolition. Before the Claxons can escape, they are arrested. After the three brewery arson victims were resurrected, and are now used as witnesses. Kat's parents are back on their deathbeds. They ask Kat to tell them the future. She reveals a bright new future where the town flourishes once more, and more break the cycle kids like her come to her school to get second chances like she did, and then her parents pass on. Wendell and Wild comfort Kat by saying they will give her parents VIP all-access passes to their new fair in the afterlife. Downstairs or upstairs? They show her their plans, a beautiful, mesmerizing fair full of fun. She turns to her parents and asks for their approval. And we get a short sentence narration from Kat before cutting back to Bearzebub laughing. End of movie. What on earth did I just watch? <laughs> So before I get to my critique, I should mention that this is based off an unreleased novel. It's been a full year and it's still not out, so I don't know if it ever will be, but kind of wish it was so some of this could be tweaked to perfection because this movie feels like a poorly sorted adaption to a book. A book that doesn't exist. Which sucks, because that means fans can't get proper answers or context to these things without digging through interviews, and even then, I don't know if we'll get answers. The animation is wild and cool and lovely, and if anyone asks why their puppet face lines weren't removed, that was a stylistic choice, apparently. And they wanted people to know for sure they were watching stop motion and not CGI. But overall, the rest of the movie is a big disappointment. It's overcrowded too many characters, it introduces lore that never gets explained, there's awkward cuts and transitions, the character interactions are really weird and unnatural, a lot of character alignments are a jumbled mess, we don't know who is friend or foe, some of them bounce back and forth within a manner of scenes to being horrible people, then back to our relatable good guy protagonists. The side characters are actually way more interesting than our main characters. This movie needs a lot of fixing. For starters, let's go over Cat Elliot, our main character. She is a terrible protagonist. She's set up as a juvenile delinquent orphan. She grew up in group homes and then prison before going into the Break the Cycle program. We don't know what got her into prison or what really went on in her childhood until later in the movie. She's advertised as this punk rock authority screwed me over so screw authority kind of character. Rebellious, mysterious, angsty, and cool. But in reality, she has two things for a personality. Orphan and total jerk. She treats everyone around her like garbage, whether they deserve it or not. Father Bests was revealed to have taken her in for money and was a false alibi for the Claxons. But in the beginning, he didn't seem overtly malicious. Even with his corrupt ulterior motives, he just wanted to save his school. At his funeral, the students are seen crying over him. He seemed well-loved in his community. Kat doesn't know this guy and obviously dislikes him because he took her in for money, but she is still completely disrespectful at his funeral. Like, honestly, I'm surprised she didn't spit on his grave. Sister Helly is also someone she's supposed to have a kinship to, as both are proclaimed as hell maidens. But when Sister Helly asks her to come up to view the octopus more closely, and it becomes demonic and starts being aggressive, Cat trips and gets zapped by something in the drawer of the desk. Helly takes her outside to see if she's okay. Cat accuses her octopus of biting her? That stupid octopus, it bit me, right? It wasn't the octopus. You're just protecting your job. Girl, your hand wasn't in the tank. You were fascinated by the creature and Sister Helly wanted you to get a closer look. 
And she's like, you just want to protect your job. Like, what do you mean? There was something in the desk drawer. You saw it. There's something weird on your hand that is completely paranormal and unnatural. And instead of freaking out and like realizing that this is something really disturbing, you're just like, your octopus bit me. Fuck you. Like, what? The poodle preps are annoying and ignorant, but they're not queen bee students that like actually severely bully her. She acts like they are though. Raul, advertised as her best friend, is the one who faces the brunt of her misplaced ire. I'm Raul. I don't do friends, Raul. Bad things happen to people I'm close to. Like what? <sighs> they die. You're coming with me. What for? Need a witness, and you're it. Now tell me what to do. About what? Not you, Raul the bear. Hand me to the Hell Maiden. Hell Maiden? Cat. I made a deal, I'm bringing my parents back. What? Shush. Maybe it was just some students messing with you. They were demons, Raul. My personal demons, and they lied. Maybe demons aren't the most trustworthy creatures to make a deal with. Come on! <laughs> but you wouldn't even be here without Cap. She's the one who summoned those demons. Uh, Ow! Pale Maiden, do you promise to serve us for all eternity? You gotta be kidding. Stop, Cap! <laughs> Stop! <laughs> Leave it, Raul. Because they promised to bring you back to life. And they did. It wasn't demons, it, it was this kid, Raul. Raul said he was your friend. I don't have friends. He's in danger, isn't he? Maybe. Then we gotta go help him. But I just got you back. Friends are like family, cat. <sighs> Fine. Uh, for your first task, get us some takeout. We are starving. Uh, I'll help. Oh, no. You and Sparky got graves to dig. Warned you, Raul. Bad things happen to people I'm close to. You did this! You summoned the demons! Don't act like this situation was out of your control. Oh, I warned you not to be friends with me because bad stuff happens to people I care about. When you were a kid, it was out of your control, but this situation is completely your fault, and you dragged him into this. What a jerk! And when she's not doing that, she's crying over her dead parents who we feel nothing for, by the way. They die at the start of the movie. I felt no attachment to these characters. Even when she does resurrect her parents, she's a jerk to them too. She just got them back and they scold her for abandoning her friend, who was the one who resurrected them for her. And she reluctantly goes to help him and tells her parents to sit and stay like they're a bunch of puppy dogs. They're adults, they can do what they want. Like, what? She hardly interacts with them despite obsessing over them the entire movie. Later in the movie, they reveal what Kat did to get herself locked up in prison. She pushed one of her grade school bullies down the stairs. It's unclear what happened to him, whether he survived with injuries or if he died. I wish they would have clarified, otherwise this would have been considered an assault. Kat was held down by guilt and trauma from her parents' deaths, going from home to home with terrible conditions and money-hungry adults, never having stability, never making any friends, never had a reason to respect authority corrupted from within. All of this would make someone irrational, agitated, defensive, and maybe even cruel. There's never a morally perfect victim. But her total lack of empathy for those around her makes her a difficult character to root for. The turning point of her character was when she beat up her self-made demon and then hugged it after she beat it down. Even then, that's still solely an interaction within herself. Even Wendell and Wild are weirdly attached to her when they've only briefly interacted with her twice, both of which were negative interactions. They even stay with her in the final fight to protect her town when they should have left with their father back to the underworld. They have nothing keeping them here anymore. Kat hasn't made connections with anyone. She hasn't made an effort to. It's always them doing things for her, even when she's given them no reason to. She's not a good protagonist. And that sucks, because I love her design. 
Raoul is cute and all, but he's just Kat's beanbag she tosses and bosses around. He's just kind of there. He's a best friend she doesn't deserve. At first, Kat suspects him of attempted murder when a brick fell nearly killing Shaban. Raoul is weirdly terrified of her at first, acting way more suspicious than he should be. Kat sits behind him and accuses him of attempted murder, but he says the brick slipped, which was true, but it dissolves any and all distrust completely. Kat just believes him. But Kat has been in prison. She's been beaten up. She's been lied to. She should absolutely still suspect Raoul and not just take his word for it, especially because she hates Siobhan too and might also want her gone. Raoul's mom is semi-important, a council member investigating the brewery fire, but he's just some kid at Kat's school. He even goes out of his way to resurrect Kat's parents to help her and then just sort of hangs out with them, just dancing to music until the plot comes to them when it feels like it. And he was working on an art project that no one but him is really meant to see that off pacingly out of nowhere happenstance becomes some important plot device to sway one of our antagonists at the end of the story. It's really random. Raul really is just there. Wendell and Wild. The movie is named after these two, and I'm glad it is, because frankly, these two were the stars in my eyes. They are two quirky, charismatic, creative demon brothers. Their father has unfairly locked them up, as they are forced to do labor, like regrowing his hair for the rest of eternity. They just want to redo his afterlife fare. If they can't make their fare in the afterlife, then they decided they'll make it in the... Uh, during life? Despite being demons, they seem to be genuine dudes. For the most part, they consider killing their beloved horse, Tardigrade, for an experiment, but they can't bring themselves to do it. When they meet their Hell Maiden, they immediately adore her despite not really interacting with her. The second meeting, they greet her and offer her anything she wants. They panic and lie to her when they can't hold up their end of the bargain, which is sly and unfair of them. But when they discover the hair cream that can bring her parents back to life, they're filled with joy, because yay, they can, you know, make up to her for this, right? And even when the Claxons tell them they can't raise any other dead than just the council members, Wendell and Wild go to argue to defend their Hell Maiden's wish, but Father Best shuts them up and forces them to go along with it. The third meeting, they get excited to see her, so delighted they even hug her, only to immediately turn around and go back on their deal like originally planned and force her to do their bidding for all eternity. They then try to kill her parents again. I mean, granted they fail, but what the hell, guys? When they resurrected Father Bests, they welcome him back to life and give him a wonderful makeover, only to turn around and try to extort him. And when they realize they can't do that, they threaten to re-kill him. Why? You have no reason to be so vicious. They also kidnap Raoul and force him to dig up graves. And when he steals the cream, they lock him in a sewer where their tardigrade is constantly trying to eat him. Later, they are tricked into believing their pets straight up ate Raoul and Cat, and they act dramatically unemotional? Like they're pretending to care, but really don't? And one of them steals her boots, which is funny, but the context? I know they are demons that have no concept of importance when it comes to souls and whether they are alive or dead because they know there's an afterlife, but come on. And at the end of the movie, their father confronts them and eventually forgives them and lets them design his new afterlife fair. They got what they wanted. They should have left to start with him right away, but they stay behind and help the Hell Maiden and all the people associated with her to stay and protect the town? Why? They have no no reason to. What's the goal here? What do you want them to be? What is their role in the movie anymore? Are they good guys or bad guys? It's so confusing. Speaking of confusing, let's cover the absolute nonsense that is the world building in this movie. These demon brothers have hair cream. Hair cream that revives anything that has died, like hair, bugs, people. It returns things to life, albeit temporarily. So they eat it and it makes them high? And they start hallucinating a little girl, Cat. 
she's asleep and they touch her hands before she disappears. Now in the real world, it looks as though Wendell and Wilde, through their hallucination, have somehow possessed a worm stuck in her candy apple and that freaks her out. But she's not asleep in the water or anything. She's very clearly awake and screaming at them. I don't understand why they're all having completely different appearance perspectives here. And why on earth would this magic life-giving cream make Wendell and Wilde hallucinate? A hallucination of which is very real, by the way. Now, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, put more thought into this than the writers did, and suggest that maybe if a demon eats it, it can't bring a demon back to life, so it takes their mind out of their body and puts it into a living one temporarily? Like a form of astral projected possession? But this isn't consistent. Wendell and Wilde eat this cream several more times throughout the movie and this never happens again. Except for one other time where they eat the cream and conveniently appear as giant heads in Cat's dream. Which is still inconsistent compared to what happened last time because last time wasn't a dream. We also have this weird demon bear named Bearzebub. He is never explained. Who is he? How was he made? Was he designed by Manberg or Belzer? Is he a demon stuck in this bear? What is his association to Manberg? His job is to look for hell maidens, ladies who can summon demons to the living world. Going to the living world is now forbidden seemingly after all of Buffalo's children disappeared after getting their own hell maidens. And despite Wendell and Wilde knowing about a hell maiden, they are completely unaware that they had other siblings? Their brothers went missing because they made contact with a hell maiden through bears above. So we can assume Buffalo forbid living world travel that included the bears above method. And then he somehow had two new sons who he kept under lock and key. How are they aware of what a hell maiden is? How are they aware of who Bearzebub is and what he does. It doesn't make sense. What even is a hell maiden? She can summon demons to the surface, yeah, but when Wendell and Wilde make her swear to serve them for all eternity, her own hand turns against her, forcing her into true servitude as though she's possessed by another entity. Her eyes glow green, their eyes glow green, Bearzebub's eyes glow green, and so does their father's. What on earth is that? Is that... I mean, like, they're clearly making a soul contract, but is there something more to this? It's revealed that Manberg is a demon hunter. He used Sister Helly as his demon summoner to collect demons throughout the decades. He claims Bearzebub is his bear without going into further explanation. He uses weird devices like a Ghostbusters vacuum to suck up demons or maybe even souls? Again, also not explained. Sister Helly summoned dozens upon dozens of demons to the world of the living. Manberg claims the green glow is a fever of sorts, indicating he has witnessed this before. Sister Helly must have gone through this at some point herself, but did she have to go through it every time she made a deal with a demon? Or did she only do it once and then just summon demons and then trick them immediately before swearing to any contracts. I mean, that must be the case, right? But even so, it's not explained. Also, why do Hell Maidens get a power? Sister Helly can turn into black smoke and moves at high speeds, while Cat has the ability to see the future. It seems to activate when she returns to her hometown, and it activates before she gets her mark, before she summons her demons, and even before she makes a contract with them. But later, after she defeats her inner demon, Sister Helly is like, here is your power, as though it's like, new? And granted to her now? But she had it all along. Also, why and how does Bearzebub communicate through a pink bubble egg through a soul jockey? What even are soul jockeys? Are they like imps? Servants? And also, ironically, <laughs> you don't need a hell maiden to get to the surface. Buffalo Belzer dug his way up manually to retrieve his sons, and he had no hell maiden. I mean, he is the king of the underworld, of course, but even when Wendell and Wilde are summoned to Earth, they're still seen going upwards through a tunnel from underground. Maybe a hell maiden automatically carves a path for them to make it easier for them to get out of hell? Why couldn't it have just teleported them directly to her location instead of halfway there? It just seems like a weird plot device to force the boys to 
to encounter and resurrect Father Best's. Best gets to be in like half the movie and Kat's parents get like two or three significant scenes tops. It's criminal, I tell you. But this hair cream, who made it? Why is it temporary? Why does it make the demons hallucinate or astral project? I'd also like to address the ending. Buffalo Belzer runs an underworld fair to torture and torment lost souls. Is this hell? Or is this like some weird limbo? It's not super clear. I'd assume it's hell, but his sons want to make a fair that lost souls will actually be safe and would want to go to, even though they're in hell? Like, isn't it kind of their thing to torture bad souls or <sighs> whatever? They get the chance to build the new fair for their father, a nicer, peaceful, safer, more entertaining fair. When Kat's parents re-die, Wendell and Wilde come over to comfort her. They say that they will give Kat's parents VIP passes to their fair in the afterlife. That would imply her, her parents are going to hell, which doesn't make sense to me. But before all that, Wendell actually says it will be the best afterlife upstairs or down, which implies that her parents, who might go to heaven, will be able to visit the dream fair in hell? What? I don't know if souls can just do that. Teeter between heaven or hell like that. That sort of defeats the entire purpose of having a heaven or hell. I mean, it's really sweet of them to show her their fair, knowing that's the place her parents can visit to have fun when they are dead, but it don't make sense. Ugh. Anyway, moving on to the other characters. Father Bests is an odd priest principal of the all-girl school. At first, he's introduced as quirky. He's running on a treadmill. Later, he gets a cool makeover and he kind of likes it. You know, he's he's kind of funny. Um, When he reaches out for a handshake and Kat refuses to take it, he slips on the treadmill and Kat says he should have blamed her and thrown her out, but he doesn't, brushing it off. He accepts Kat into the school kindly enough, but Kat is suspicious of it because she sees a crack in the window. She immediately knows they took her for money, but father best counters with her needing a second chance. He doesn't lie to her, but he also points out the equal exchange that also works in her favor. He doesn't seem overtly malicious, but then it's revealed he was a false alibi for the Claxons in the brewery fire incident. He gently tries to push an equal trade extortion to get more money for his school. Instead of agreeing, however, shockingly, the Claxons straight up murder and drown him? At his funeral, all the girls are crying for him. Despite the odd first interaction, action of his character, he seems to have been genuinely beloved by students at the school. Even Raoul. When he's revived, everyone celebrates. But when Kat confronts him, he makes the awful and unfair remark that he's more important than Kat's parents? Which is an arrogant misconception, the rudest thing to say possible. Like, why would you say that? But when he accuses Kat and Raoul of keeping him imprisoned in his own office, they just get detention. He sucks up to the Claxons, and he's a bad person for it, but they're the only rich people left in town. They're the only ones who can save his school, so he's, you know, he fell to corruption. Despite being a priest, he is also weirdly cool with being undead and having demons for partners. Like, he doesn't really act like a priest dealing with unholy forbidden magic at all. I mean, I want to like him, but honestly, he took up way too much time in this movie. I sadly think... He should have stayed dead. Shaban, the Poodles, and the Klaxons. Shaban, you'd think, would be the school queen bee alpha bitch. But she's actually not. When she's first introduced with her two friends, they welcome Kat to the school. They are downright annoying, poking at her, dancing around her, touching her stuff. Kat goes to punch Shaban when Shaban pokes her dad's boombox, but gets a vision and instead saves her life. Shaban thinks that Kat is suddenly the best thing to happen to this school in a long time, and it's revealed even though she's annoying, she's actually a good person. She theorizes what Kat's power is with her friends, and when she says Kat is an interrupter of the status quo and Raul interrupts her, she refers to him as his dead name Ramona, but immediately and sincerely apologizes for it. She delivers cookies to Kat, worried about her, but ignorant to how prison really works, praising it for all the good it does to criminals. Later, she confronts her parents about how prisons actually are. She apparently somehow learned the truth that prisons are horrid and that the people behind them are corrupt. She finds this out off screen, by the way. 
she goes to warn Kat and the others, and Kat is like, I'm a hell maiden. And Siobhan's like, yeah, cool, okay, uh, so my parents are gonna destroy the entire town, we should probably stop them. She does stand at Kat's side in the end to protect the town against her parents, so she's a genuine person. Even Raoul defended her, saying she's okay despite having a falling out before. Her parents, the Claxons, are genuinely evil, evil people. Super rich corporate heads that have killed people when they don't get what they want. They were responsible for destroying Kat's parents' family business and killing all their workers inside. They killed Father Best's too, and who knows who else? They get arrested in the end. I think this movie was trying to go for like, oh, we have demons and queen bees and ex-criminals, but the real demons are the rich. Or something like that, but they kind of fail to keep this message clear because all of these people are simultaneously bad, good people. It's kind of awkward, honestly. Sister Helly and Manberg leave it to this movie to make the side characters a hundred times more interesting than our main character. Main character? Orphan juvenile delinquent. That's it. Side characters? Jewish handicapped demon hunter paranormal expert and long-term hell maiden demon summoner smoke-powered church nun and teacher. Who are you people? I want to watch their story, not hers. What on earth happened here? So I'll say they start off with a really, really messed up relationship. Manberg bursts into the classroom to write on Sister Helly's own board that she is a thief trying to get her into trouble? What she stole was his teddy bear, Bearzebub, the hell maiden finder. What was he trying to accomplish here? Like on one hand, hey, what did Sister Helly steal from you? My teddy bear? Versus, hey, what did Sister Helly steal from you? My possessed demon finding teddy bear? You're in a church, but you're 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 in a Catholic school. Like I, I don't I really don't think you should be doing this. This is this is bad news bears, pun intended, all around. Like don't do this. Later, Helly confronts him when there's a new hell maiden. She says Manberg came to her when she was only twelve when she summoned her first demons. He manipulated her to continue to summon and imprison every demon they encountered, regardless of if the demons had done anything wrong, which sister Helly was upset over. Over. Why did Helly steal the bear? Because she had finally quit and thought Manberg would use his bear to find another Hell Maiden and continue his work? What is really going on here? Manberg snaps rubber bands at her, but she catches them and snaps them right back. You know, badass, but this guy is clearly older than Helly, so he absolutely groomed her into demon hunting. It's a really awkward, kind of gross backstory. But Sister Helly is the kind of person Kat can lean on. She's a mentor, a teacher, one of the few good people in Kat's life. But Sister Helly isn't upfront with her about anything. When Kat becomes a hell maiden, Sister Helly's like, oh, that means you're special, but it's our secret, so don't tell anyone. And Kat completely illogically blames her for her octopus biting her and that Sister Helly doesn't want her to tell anyone because she just wants to protect her job. Kat's been in situations like that before, but this whole scene is totally different. Kat completely misreads the situation and Sister Helly really doesn't help. Helly is quite persistent in helping her. She finally does in the end. She asks Manberg to bloodbind them, and when Kat has the fever, Manberg is like, this could kill you, and it almost does? I don't... What is bloodbinding? Also, how do you know what that is? Who are you? Who are you people? Speaking of who are you, there's a Native American indigenous lady, Miss Hunter. She was always at Kat's side, delivering her from home to home, seemingly working for a rehousing transportation for juveniles. She's a side character and probably not as interesting as the other two with an insane backstory, but she's still really cool with a nice design. I think it would have been nice to see a little bit more of her too. Kat's parents absolutely should have gotten more screen time. 
they are killed off immediately and used as Kat's trauma device instead of feeling like their own people. Her dad runs the most successful brewery in town, the business that is holding the town together. It's fancy, it's schnazzy, it's popular, it's wonderful, and her mom apparently owns a library. They were sweet, community-oriented people. They were the heart of the town, and they are killed off immediately, and their brewery was destroyed off-screen. With brewery workers killed off-screen too, by the way. And it's not even a secret who destroyed or killed them. Like, we know immediately it's the Claxons from their phone call. And it's reiterated when they kill Father Bests. The Claxons should have been more careful, more secretive. And Kat's parents deserved more screen time. When they are resurrected, all they do is just stand around and dance. Literally. They're doing nothing. They help stand against the Claxons at the end of the story, but they immediately die again afterwards. They really only come back to scold their daughter for being a bad person to Raoul and tell her to do the right thing to save the town. Again, I am so much more interested in the side characters than our own main character. Her parents are more interesting than she is. This movie feels too long and yet also incomplete. Honestly, I think it would have worked better if it had just been a short series. I still hope one day the novel will come out to fix some of this, but as it stands, this is all we have. So I'm gonna try my take on how to potentially fix this. First off, make Kat more likable. Spend more time of this film with her and her parents. Showcase the entire town, how lively it is, how they take care of everyone. Show Kat going through the brewery with her parents as they show her everything she's going to inherit one day. And we meet the workers and see her mother's library. It's just a beautiful, lively town. Her parents are truly the stars of the show. But one day, she comes across a stuffed bear, maybe found abandoned. Also have Wendell and Wilde's opening scene, giving the audience context for their prison garb and their dream fair they tried to present to their father. And when they fall asleep, they dream of little cat. This is when she has the bear now, by the way. When they touch her, that's when she gets her mark. That's when she starts getting bad luck. That's when she gets her power. She wakes up screaming, terrified, and in pain. Her parents, in a panic, try to drive her to a hospital after seeing her hand injury. They're driving in the rainstorm when she's crying in pain. But that is what ends up killing them because they're so distracted and in such a hurry, you know? So Kat's guilt feels more solid this time. The demons can now constantly communicate with her, but she brushes it off because at the hospital or psychiatric evaluation, she was told that they were just her intrusive thoughts that appeared in response to the traumatic event she suffered. The demons are sort of her only friends. She goes from group home to group home, getting snippets of the future, always talking to herself, and she's bullied for being weird. Wendell and Wilde often visit her to experience their escapism and whisper in her ear to fight back against those kids since they can't help her and they don't want their friend to be bullied anymore. They tell her to fight back and she finally snaps and does so. She pushes a kid down the stairs, accidentally killing him. She is shocked and horrified, blaming it on the voices in her head. When she goes to prison, the demons self-reflect and are deeply upset over it. The whole point they were astral projecting or possessing their hell maiden was to experience life outside of prison, but now they got her stuck there. One of the brothers apologizes to Kat while the other says the bully still deserved it, but for the most part, they regret it. They never wanted Kat to end up in jail too. She eventually forgives them because she has no one else but them to speak to, but she gets into fights in jail, lashing out in anger, fighting and disrespecting authority. Her only solace is Wendell and Wilde. And they speak to her, telling her of a world without screams or terror, a fantastical theme park, their dream fair they've wanted to build ever since they were young, a dream of escapism that entertains Kat through her harder years. They say that one day, when they convince their dad to maybe build a better theme park for lost souls, she'll get to go on all the rides. Wilde playfully says, well, hey now, how are you going to pay for all those rides? You got to do something for us first. And Kat accuses them of pushing her to push that kid down the stairs, winding her up in jail. They fall quiet at that, awkwardly shut down, but Kat sighs and gives in because she has long since forgiven them and offhandedly suggests, maybe I wouldn't have to wait until I die to actually hang out with you guys. Maybe one day I can find a way to get you to come over to the land of the living so you can bust me out of here. <laughs> I'd like to see that. You'd be getting us out of here too. Jailbreak. Promise? 
offhandedly, no pun intended, replies, I swear it, unintentionally making a deal with them and waking up her inner demon. But because the deal was made in reference to a day in the future, her fever doesn't come early on. Like, it's kind of a gradual thing. It's it's it, it's held off for now because there's, there's no, like, time limit right now for it. It's not like a summon us now kind of thing, you know? Later, when she is released to RBC Girls through the Break the Cycle project, she is a no-nonsense punk rock gal. She got into a lot of fights in juvie. She's definitely not the same person she was. She still has major anger issues and hates authority, but she's not as selfish. When Shaban shows up to annoy her by touching her father's boombox, Kat's eyes glow green and she feels her fist raise, her inner demon feeling the need to punch her. But her foresight activates and she resists and saves Shaban and assumes Raul had attempted to kill her. Kat had gone to jail for killing her bully, so she tries to scare Raul, keeping an eye on him to prevent him from going down the same path, when really it's been a misunderstanding. She also threatens Shaban to leave Raul alone without realizing the two actually used to be best friends but just had a soft falling out. Shaban is kind of respectful and happy that Kat saved her life, but she kind of spreads a rumor at school that Kat has magical foresight, like she might be a witch. The other kids think it's cool, but the nuns are creeped out about it and treat Kat badly for it, so Kat is upset at Shaban for it regardless of her intention. Raul is the odd one out at school, too. The only boy in an all-girl school, so he too doesn't have any friends. Despite Kat's initial suspicions, the two interact and slowly become friends as Kat realizes he didn't mean any harm. As the days go on, the people around her are subjected to many bad omens or dangers, all of which she sees from the future. Whether she prevents them from happening or allows them to happen depends on her mood or the context. But Sister Helly takes notice of her power, as does Manberg. Kat is seen walking through her destroyed town late at night where she snuck out of RBC Girls. She sees the brewery, the library, the houses, everything in ruins. Many people left, died, or were mysteriously murdered. It's nothing but a cold wasteland. Her demons aren't accessible in her mind at this point, so she feels lost, confused, and alone when she visits her parents' grave. Raul, working on his art project, spots her through his eyeglass and rushes down to join her. She's upset to have been disturbed, but Raul tells her about his mom and how she knew the Elliots. He heard stories of how wonderful the town used to be, maybe even recounts some old memories of the place. She is comforted, happy that Raul came to her side, until he mentions his mother has been investigating the fire and believes it was arson. What did you say? How long has she been suspecting this? Who is she suspecting? Kat starts shaking him by the shoulders, but Raul doesn't know that information. Before Kat can demand more, they are found by Sister Helly and taken back to RBC Girls. Siobhan visits her with cookies. You know, that scene where she says everyone was worried about her plays, where she showcases her ignorance toward private prisons. This is when Wendell and Wilde discover that hair cream has resurrecting abilities. They decide that if their hell maiden ever does manage to break them out of jail, they'd surprise her by returning her parents to her. She wouldn't be an orphan anymore, and they'd prevent her from going back to Jill. The one thing Kat doesn't see coming is Father Best's mysterious death. She wasn't around when it happened, so her power wouldn't have saved him. Not that she really cared. She didn't really like him. and She didn't know him very long. But she does find it suspicious that the Claxons, Shaban's parents, to her surprise, have suddenly bought the school and taken it over, announcing the acceptance of several more Break the Cycle kids in the future. Kat gets a really bad feeling at them as they stare at her a little too long. One night, when Kat tries to sneak out again to go talk to Raul to speak to his mom, before she can even get there, her hand turns bright green and drags her away towards the janitor's room. She struggles with it, trying to get it to stop when it opens the door. It's never done this before, so she's freaked out. She is forced inside, shocked at how large the room actually is, and the oddities inside. There's a book laying out on the table that her hand is drawn to, opening it to the page on Hell Maidens with a mark just like hers. She gasps in shock and grabs the book. When she does, the janitor's closet bangs and rattles, freaking her out. She then gets a vision of the janitor returning and makes a quick exit. Manberg enters, realizing his book has been stolen. Kat is flipping through the book when Siobhan's parents come across her, asking what she's doing out this late. Kat hides the book behind her back. They are suspicious of her and suggest maybe she's acting out, getting into trouble, and say this is her first strike. 
If they see her acting out again, then her sponsorship will be canceled and she will be thrown back in prison. Kat tries to argue against them when Sister Helly shows up, making an excuse for her. Helly brings her into a corner and tries to grab the book from her. Kat tells her to let her go. Don't summon your demons, Kat, Helly warns her. Kat tries to play dumb, but Sister Helly isn't having it. Terrible, horrible things will happen if you bring them to the surface. So whatever you do, do not summon them. You have to promise me. Kat's eyes glow and she refuses, grabbing the book and running away. Sister Helly accidentally tears out some of the pages as Kat runs away. The pages regarding something called the fever. Kat mulls over Sister Helly's words, resisting her hand, placing the book under her pillow. But she realizes that the Claxons might send her back to prison, so she needs to summon Wendell and Wilde as backup. In her dreams, she communicates with them, telling them that she finally found a way to get them to the surface. Excited, they start packing. When Kat tries to summon her demons, she gets interrupted by Raoul, who is shocked to see her in such a witchy state. He says he didn't want to believe Shabon and the others, spreading rumors about Kat being a witch. But now seeing her trying to summon demons, Kat, what are you doing? Demons, aren't they evil? Kat gets mad at him and tries the spell again, but it doesn't work. She only gets angrier and storms off. Raoul follows her. Wendell and Wilde are summoned to the world of the living, but in a different area because she was interrupted. Wendell and Wilde notice how terrible her town looks. It isn't anything like how she described. Maybe something happened to everyone. They decide to go resurrect her parents as a surprise gift to her for freeing them from prison. But there's one issue. They don't know who her parents are or where they're buried. So they decide to resurrect every dead person in the town cemetery. <laughs> Cut to Manberg who opens his closet revealing all the demons wiping dust off their jars. Sister Helly is bickering with him, revealing a little bit of their past together, kind of reminiscent to the scene they had in the movie. He suddenly stops and starts sniffing the air and smiles wickedly with excitement. She's summoned them, he says, and wheels off with gadgets in his hand. Sister Helly is hot on his trail, realizing, oh no, Cat really did summon them. However, Manberg and Sister Helly go to town and instead of seeing demons, they see an army of undead and they are in shock. The Claxons also see the army of undead and come to the conclusion, based off what their daughter had unintentionally told them, that this must be the work of the weird new girl Cat. Sister Helly disappears in a puff of smoke to find Cat. Cat's eyes glow green and she pushes Raoul onto the ground hard. She snaps out of it in fear, staring at her hand. She didn't hear Wendell and Wilde telling her to fight back like she did when she was a child. This violence, it was all her. She runs away. Raoul's okay, but is now surrounded by undead people. Maybe even Father Bests? Not necessarily malicious, but more so panicked, asking where they are, what happened, asking for help, and he's overwhelmed as he swarmed. Sister Helly confronts Kat in her dorm room, and Kat is distraught and confused as to why the dead are being raised. She never chanted a spell like that. Sister Helly sees Kat's hand and asks her where she got that marking. Sister Helly spots something poking out of Kat's bag, and it's her old bear. And Sister Helly reveals that bear used to be hers. The same demonic bear that Kat had found. She reveals that she used to be a hell maiden too, and Manberg, a demon hunter, demanded she summon her demons so she could capture them, or else he would out her to the church and have her exorcised. After several decades of capturing demons, she had finally had enough. Kat asks what the demons did to be so horrible, to cause so much chaos. But Sister Helly shakes her head, saying it was their capture that upset her. She was upset because Manberg kept locking them up, regardless of what they do. She says that sometimes people of the living are worse than the creatures below. Kat's eyes glow green and she is overheated and in pain. She almost passes out. Sister Helly realizes it's the fever and panics, rushing her to Manberg's office. Manberg isn't there. He's out fighting off some of the skeletons, when suddenly he gets an alert on his watch that someone has invaded his room. He's extremely annoyed and wheels back around to the church. Sister Helly goes into the redemption chamber holding Kat's hand, and the scene where she defeats her and her demon happens. Sister Helly, though, is protecting her from some of the blows because her demon is particularly powerful. After her demon is defeated and accepted, Sister Helly passes out with a concussion. Kat drops to her knees in a panic, trying to wake her up, unsure what to do. Kat rushes to the door and it bursts open with the klaxons and several police officers. Officers. See, she's unsalvageable. Take her away. They are shocked and accuse her of attacking a nun. Cat protests trying to escape, but she was dragged away from Sister Helly. Some officers try to approach Helly and check her vitals. The Claxons say Sister Helly is replaceable and leave. Laughing as Cat is forced into a truck and driven away, back to the prison. This driver's different, though. Miss Hunter is in a different van. 
speeding to the school, but skids to a halt and gets out when she sees Kat driven away back to the prison by a different driver. Kat is shouting at her that it wasn't her fault, that she didn't do anything to get help for Sister Helly. Miss Hunter looks back at the school. Cut to Raul still surrounded by dead people when suddenly he is hoisted up and away. Are you alright, young man? It's both of Kat's parents. They help him and ask if he's okay. He says he is and thanks them for helping. In a calmer manner, they ask him where they are. He explains to them that this is indeed their old town and that they are dead. They're in shock. They can't believe it. What happened? Where is their daughter, Cat Elliot? They ask. Raoul realizes who they are and explains that their brewery was burned down and the town lost its main source of income. Raoul says Cat is a student at RBC Girls like he is, and he walks them in the direction of the town when they see a prison transport taking her away. They all rush to RBC Girls to figure out what is going on. Raoul gets a call from his mother asking if he's okay and what the heck is going on. Raoul explains the dead have risen and stay inside so they don't hound her. His mother realizes something and looks at her board in regards to the dead brewery workers. She abruptly hangs up the phone. Raul's like, mom? Mom? But she won't pick up. He still rushes back to RBC Girls. When they get there, Manberg and Shabon are tending to Sister Helly, who is still knocked out. If there were any police there, they aren't there any longer. They were called out to deal with the situation outside. Raul asks what happened and Shabon says Kat attacked Sister Helly. Raul shakes his head saying Kat would never do that. Shabon says that's what her parents told her, that they were witnesses. Kat's parents come in and shock them. They know that in her heart, she just, she's not that person. But they too stand up for their daughter, even if they haven't seen her in forever. But Miss Helly wakes up and confirms the truth. Kat did nothing wrong. Sister Helly says, the raising of the dead must have been her demons doing. Cat might be the only one who can stop them. That's when Miss Hunter shows up, and Raul and Shabon go with her to rescue Cat from the prison she's being taken to out of town. Manberg, Helly, and Cat's parents equip themselves to handle the crowd, unknowing yet that they'll have a different enemy to face. This is when we see Wendell and Wild and their tardigrade horse, Sparkplug, getting chased by their dad's soul jockeys. They're trying to fight them off, but there's too many of them. Manberg, Helly, and Cat's parents come in to help, fighting off the soul jockeys and a few of the undead. Wendell and Wilde are excited they actually raise Kat's parents and ask where she is. They are told she's been sent back to prison because of all this mess. They panic, realizing raising the dead may have been a mistake. Their dad is listening to all this through the soul jockeys, through some kind of astral projection. He finds out what they did and is shocked and becomes thoroughly pissed off over their disobedience and negligence. He gets up and commands his remaining soul jockeys to bring him to the surface, letting his scream burst light off him and get destroyed. A short time skip where Kat is now back in juvie going to get her paperwork refilled. Siobhan and Raul sneak in. Siobhan sees how awful the conditions actually are. Packed in like sardines, cold clothing, terrible food, horrible conditions. She's horrified that this is what her parents want to expand, what they want to build in that town. Eventually, the two, with the help of maybe Siobhan's goat, find Kat and help her escape. Siobhan apologizes to Kat and Kat accepts her apology. She also thanks Raul for always sticking to her side and thanks Miss Hunter for driving them there. Miss Hunter says, don't tell my boss, and floors it, speeding back to town. Dawn starts to break. Another short time jump for the ride back. Raul tells Kat that the undead have risen. She can't believe it. Why and how? Raul says Manberg and Helly mentioned something about demons. Kat whispers, Wendell and Wild. She suddenly gets a vision of a giant hand coming up out of the ground, going to crush their van. She yells at Miss Hunter to watch out as the ground quakes and Buffalo Belzer shows up on the surface. And he's like, what is going on here? You know, scene similar to what happens at the end of the movie. They run from him. They fight him. But Kat bumps into her demons and finally meets them face to face. And there's a moment of silence and then they're like, hell made in, and they hug. Kat hugs them back, so happy to finally see them, but then she pulls their ears and yells at them. She's like, why did you raise the dead? And they say, we did it for you. And she's like, for me? That's when Belzer captures them and he sees Raul's art project and cools his anger towards his boys. His boys explain their frustrations at just wanting to be free and build their own amusement park. They want to live their own lives. They want to make more friends. They find out they have siblings. Manberg is moved and eventually confesses he had kidnapped all of Buffalo Belzer's children and is willing to return them if he lets everyone go. You know, that whole scene, it's, it's pretty nice, you know, whatever. When Belzer puts everyone down, Kat comes face to face with her undead parents and gasps. She runs into their arms and they hug her. They admire how much she's grown. She says she's sorry for everything that happened, but they assure her it's not her fault. 
They are also so proud of her, a shining light in a dead town. That's when the Klaxons show up and start yelling about how Kat escaped and that she's a monster. They're shocked Shaban is there with her, supporting her. Shaban lists off how awful prisons are, how they just want control over the school for the break the cycle money. And Raul's mom shows up with the brewery witnesses, Father Bests, and the police to arrest the Klaxons for murder, arson, and corruption. Father Bests is not taking any second chances. He is not simping for them, all right? He does not need their money no more. He will send them straight to prison. That alibi is gone. Kat turns back to her parents and asks how and why they were resurrected. Wendell and Weil reveal that it was a surprise for her for breaking them out of prison. Belzer informs them that the hair cream they used was only temporary and they deflate with sorrow. Kat turns to her parents. The undead start to wither and die again. Buffalo Belzer tells his sons to come come along back to the underworld with him to help him rebuild his fair. But they look back at Kat and her parents and they refuse. Belzer is shocked they refuse and asks why. They say that their fair design isn't meant for the underworld after all. Eventually they will come back to the underworld, but they want a break after they've helped their friend get their town rebuilt. But for now, they deserve a long vacation away while Belzer makes up for lost time with his other kids. Belzer shrugs it off and agrees, telling his sons he loves them, and then he leaves. Kat doesn't want to say goodbye to her parents, but they ask her to tell them about the future, the future of their new town. And so Kat looks into that future. It's like we're actually there, though, as she's narrating it instead of just being shown, like, shadow puppets. It's like that is the current present. We're, we sort of jump there. Everyone is coming home, and the town is being rebuilt and renewed again, lively and colorful. Instead of a brewery, though, in its place is the magic massive theme park Wendell and Wilde built. And at some point, some soul jockeys come by with some fresh made hair cream. Kat is surprised. She resurrects her parents one more time to bring them around town and maybe even go on the fair rides with her. At the end, she asks, mom, dad, what do you think? And they come in to hug her, as does her other friends with Wendell and Wilde. The end. Or something like that. Like, that's just my personal taste of how it could end. But, like, really, where did that hair cream come from? If Wendell and Wilde had been replacing their dad's hair for over a decade or two, you'd think they'd have run out of hair cream and just gotten more, yeah? Oh, her parents should stay dead because it resembles moving on and it's more realistic. Psh, we've got magic hair cream, people. Let's utilize it. Anyway, yeah, Wendell and Wilde is a 4 out of 10 for me. Like, it's still entertaining. The animation is lovely, but oh, that screenplay needed some major help. And I still believe it would have worked better as a miniseries than a movie. It's a shame, really. But yeah, you know, check it out and tell me what you think. Anyway, thanks to my patrons for making this video possible. Links to social media are in the description. Have a good rest of your day. Love y'all. Goodbye.